Our gospel lesson this morning is from Mark's gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went to throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come, move freely about us, we pray. May the meditations in our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight. And Lord, lead us not only to holy communion, but lead us to holy living. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen. A good way to get to know someone better is to spend more time with them. Two people can have a a long-distance relationship, but things can change either for the better or for the worse once they actually get to see each other more often and spend more time with one another. We all have friends that live in various places, meaning geographically, but also various places, meaning in the social platforms. And we can relate to them on a certain level, but when living in the same community and seeing others with greater frequency, we might realize that there are friends that are better remaining in that sphere of chatting and texting. I'm just being honest here. While there are other people that the more we get to know them, the more we want to be with them, the more we want to hang out together, if you will. We appreciate the the level of comfort we have with dear friends that we can count on in life. And it's good when we can be authentically ourselves without having trying to impress the other because through the span of that friendship, they have probably seen us at our worst and love us anyway. Now, a a good way for us to get to know God is is not through that long-distance relationship. Knowing God only as the holy other God who is in the heavenly realm, way out there, a heavenly omnipotent being, or God as that great vending machine in the sky, and we put in our request hoping that something would rain down. Certainly that can be a start in how we might reach out to God. But God doesn't want a long-distance relationship with us. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus into the world. And so to get to know God, we need to get to know Jesus. And we get to know Jesus, and as we get to know Jesus, we know who God is, and we know the very nature of God. In the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus say to his disciples, the Father and I are one. And he goes on to say that he has come to do the works of the Father. And he says, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. And later in that same gospel, he says, if you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And so if we want to know who God is, we spend time getting to know this Jesus as we open up the scriptures. This Jesus who's made known in the breaking of bread when we share in a little while later the sacrament of Holy Communion. 
we, we come to know this Jesus by spending time with God in prayer and in worship. We can learn more and more about Jesus as we live out that command to love God, love oh, not only God, but love others in the way that we ourselves have been loved by God. And we come to know this Jesus by reading the scriptures that tell the Jesus story. That story of Jesus and his love for each of us. So who is this Jesus? Well, we open up the scriptures and we learn and we try to understand. Our gospel lesson today is a continuation from the lesson from last Sunday. And together, these lessons, they they can be read kind of like a a day in the life of. a, A day in the life of Jesus. So if you want to get to know who this Jesus is, read about him. See how he went about his days. Take notice of what he did, where he went, what he taught. What did he say? Who was he with? Who are the type of people that he called into ministry? Who did he upset as he went from place to place? In 19 verses in chapter 1 of Mark's gospel, we learn a great deal about Jesus in that, that one day. Last week's lesson and today's lesson. See, last week's gospel lesson was that first part of that day. And he was in the synagogue, and he taught as one as having authority, and he healed a man with an unclean spirit. And now the scene shifts from the synagogue, a very public place, to a more private place in a home. This home belongs to Simon and Andrew, two of his newly called disciples. And this home would be a place of residence for Jesus whenever he was in that place part of Galilee. And here in that house, there's another opportunity to reveal who Jesus is. As he brought healing, only this time he heals Simon's mother-in-law who had a fever. Now, when we read the story, we say, it's just a fever. There doesn't need to be Jesus there to, to heal that fever. I mean, it's just a fever. Just, just give her some Tylenol and tell her to rest and she'll be okay. But in biblical times, whenever we come across the word fever, it, it signals something more. It signals that this is something that can only be cured by God. Not just by giving her Tylenol and take these pills and you'll be better. And so what is Mark saying in the story? Right here at the very beginning in chapter 1 of his gospel, he's giving us a clue as to who this Jesus is. Jesus took Simon's mother-in-law, he picked her up, and the fever left her. The fever could only be cured by God. So who is this Jesus? Jesus. Is this Jesus just another prophet in a line of prophets? Is Jesus just sent into the world to be that great moral example that we might follow in that way and be good ourselves? No, in the story, it's one of many revelations about who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God who came to bring forth healing. To, he came to bring forth salvation. Now, in the season after the Epiphany, each of the gospel lessons we have been looking at reveals something about Jesus. We're, we're seeing something about his identity, and there are people who get it, and there are people who have yet to see. And, and we see that in those early stages of the gospel. These stories reveal something about Jesus, how not everyone sees and understands. I hope that as we journey in the scriptures that our understanding grows, that we begin to see more and more clearly as to who Jesus is and how we are going to follow Jesus in that way. And so we journey by faith, and as we do so, we learn more and more about this Jesus. And I hope that you and I never become complacent and comfortable with what we already know. I hope we don't become comfortable with saying, you know, I've read the Bible, I'm good. I hope that we will continue to read and deepen our understanding and deepen our awareness for our need for Jesus. For I hope that we're not just comfortable with how we've experienced Jesus in the past, 
but how we can experience the presence of Jesus in the here and now on this day. And so I hope we are lifelong learners of the gospel. I hope we'll be able to see what God is trying to reveal to us each time the community gathers together and we open up the Jesus story and we find ourselves in that story and being able to relate to God in that wonderful and meaningful way. I hope in our reading that we come not just to know the historical, the biblical Jesus, but we come to experience the very presence of Christ here and now. So on this day in the life of Jesus, we go from synagogue to a house. We go from healing of a man to the healing of a woman. The healing of a person with an unclean spirit to someone with a fever. And this reveals that Jesus came to heal various maladies among a wide range of people. And Jesus can bring healing in all kinds of environments. It should also say something about how we should experience the presence of Jesus, not just when we gather in a public place like a a sanctuary for worship, but also when we are in a private place in our homes with family and friends and we pray with one another and we read the scriptures. Hopefully, we experience Christ when we gather for worship, yes, during this public opportunity to engage in worship. But I also hope We experience the presence of Christ when we are having that conversation with another in our home, when we open up the scriptures during our lunch break at work. What we read, what is revealed, what we experience from Jesus in our worship in the sanctuary, in our prayers and reflections away from this sanctuary, in our homes and wherever we are during the week, it should call from us a response. Because hopefully we are engaged with Jesus. Hopefully we're learning more about Jesus. And hopefully we're listening in and we're hearing Jesus guide us and direct us. Telling us what we are to be about. There should be this response from us. And yes, one of our responses is to be here and to worship our Lord. God doesn't heal someone just because God is a loving God. And if that were the case, then everyone who's ever asked for healing would be healed in the way that they asked. But we all know people who've asked for healing, and the healing didn't come in the way that they wanted. And this in no means that God loves only those who were healed and those who were not. He loves them less. That's not the case. God doesn't call a person into ministry because God has found favor in that person more so than another. Meaning a careful look at the people he called, Jesus called in to be his disciples, we really know he's not calling the most gifted, the most talented, the ones who are most likely to succeed. He called and still calls very ordinary people to be open to an extraordinary God who invites them on an extraordinary journey to get caught up in God's work. Any good that those disciples would do, any good that we do, is when we are opening ourselves up to God to work through us. So there's to be this call and response. There's usually this what's next in our faith. There is usually this happens so that, and then we live into what that so that will be as we seek to follow Jesus. Now, with the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, she immediately lives out her what's next. She immediately lives out the so that in her life as she begins to do what? We read in the scriptures that she serves them. Now, please do not think for a moment that Jesus heals this woman so that she will be well enough to make him dinner. That's not what's going on here. Yeah, Jesus may have been hungry, but that's not why he healed her. No, he is bringing healing to this woman, not just to take care of him. No, that's not what's going on. Nor does this mean that she's being restored to perform a role suitable for a woman. Friends, that's not what's going on here either. What this signifies is that Simon's mother-in-law, who was healed, 
who was touched by the love and the grace of Jesus, the saving power of Jesus. She has come to know who this Jesus is. And the disciples who are already following Jesus, they're still kind of wondering who Jesus is and what he's all about. She has clarity. And she immediately seeks to serve this Holy One of God. Just like in the synagogue, the unclean spirits knew who Jesus was in that moment as the Holy One of God. Here in the house, Simon's mother-in-law, she gets it. She knows who Jesus is, and she responds to Jesus' healing touch in her life, and she wants to serve him. You know, word easily spread about Jesus' healing presence, and so people flocked to the home. And what do we read in the scriptures? That the whole city was gathered around the door, and Jesus cured many who were sick in various diseases. From this day in the life of Jesus, we learn that a good part of his ministry would be about bringing forth healing, both of sickness and disease, healing from sin as well. See, healing and salvation are the same word in Greek, suzo. Suzo is used in various places in the scripture, and it can mean to save, to heal, to deliver to make whole. And so with these early healings, we're getting a great insight to Jesus as the Holy One of God who came to bring forth healing, who came to bring forth salvation to humankind. The people in Capernaum needed this teaching. They needed this healing. They needed this salvation. But such wasn't reserved just for them. For God had sent Jesus, what do we read, into the world, that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to do what? To redeem, to heal, to forgive, to make whole, to rescue, to save. And so what started there in that region of Galilee on the north side of that sea needed to go forth from Capernaum and spread as Jesus went from place to place. This Galilean preacher, this Galilean healer had a mission to fulfill. So where does Jesus go next? The next scene, Jesus has gone to a a deserted place. You might think, well, there's all these people who are still in need of healing. There's got to be a great demand on his time. What do you mean he went to a deserted place and there he prayed? It's interesting the manner in which the disciples sought Jesus. Did you catch the word? Simon and the disciples were hunting for Jesus. Hunting for Jesus. I mean, what an interesting way to describe the intensity by which they were looking for Jesus. Were they out there in the wilderness trying to track Jesus down? Had they made plans to return Jesus to the place where they wanted Jesus to be because Jesus was on high demand? Were they out there in the deserted place, out there in the wilderness? Were they trying to rein in this Jesus for themselves? Were they wanting Jesus to do ministry on their terms? to minister to more of their family and their friends? Were they wanting Jesus to serve them, to meet their desires, to bless their work, to bless their concerns and their issues and their needs, and Jesus could meet them? It seems that in their hunting for Jesus, they were wanting Jesus to serve them, not the other way around. Remember Simon's mother-in-law, the first deacon, if you will, served him, and not the other way around. Simon's mother-in-law, after being touched by the healing hands of Jesus, sought only to serve Jesus. She understood. And so there, as the disciples were hunting down Jesus, he reminds them of what he was all about. He reminds them of the mission. He wasn't to remain in one place to serve and meet the needs of people in one place, even as great as those needs may have been. He was to go from neighboring town to neighboring town, and disciples were to follow him. 
for he was sent by God who loved the whole world that he sent Jesus in the world to redeem it and to save it, not just to Capernaum, not just in a synagogue, not just in a one person's home in, in Capernaum, but that way needed to spread so that more and more would come to know and experience the healing and saving grace of Jesus, Son of God. Friends, this work that started way long ago, that work continues among us today. After experience the saving grace of Jesus, we would do well to be like Simon's mother-in-law. And simply be willing to serve Jesus. To lay aside what we want from Jesus and be open to what we truly need. To lay aside our agendas and seek to live out the mission of being disciples of Jesus who walks in a rather particular way. That way that leads to life. To lay aside the many good things that we can do and focus on the one good that we can seek to serve Christ. And we're not just to serve Christ when we gather within the walls of the church, but when we seek to be the church outside of these walls, out there in the world. You know, in, in this story, as disciples hunted Jesus down, I, I think they meant well. I really do. I think they meant well, but Jesus reminded them of his mission. And he went throughout the Galilee to proclaim the message of God's saving grace. And this mission continues as we go forth, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Yes, when we gather in this place to worship the Lord, but when we go forth from this place and we seek to offer the good news of Jesus in our words, with our signs, and in our deeds. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.